Today we have the Bill Cushman Lecture Series, and Mr. Cushman is one of those legends. Uh, he was a teacher here when I was here, then I had the opportunity to work with him as a colleague, and members of the roundtable can certainly attest that he is an unbelievable legend of Baylor School, and that's what this lecture series provides us with an opportunity to do today. And so we have an amazing speaker, um, and I'm going to bring forward someone who is near and dear to him to be able to introduce him. And I'm just going to say a couple things about Jolie Anderson. Speaking of legends, uh, we have a lot of, of you have been able to interact with Jolie. If you've done community service at all at Baylor, really the most important stated. In judging our progress as individuals, we tend to concentrate on external factors such as one's social position, influence and popularity, wealth and standard of education. He went on to say, though, that internal factors may be even more crucial to assessing one's development as a human being. Honesty, sincerity, simplicity, humility, pure generosity, absence of vanity, readiness to serve others, qualities which are within reach of every soul. If one were to take all of those aspirational internal factors and combine them with passion for craft, Therein would lie Bill Cushman and John Anderson. Cush enriches every life to become fuller, deeper, richer in spirit. He simply makes us all better human beings. And the formative impact of Cush's commitment to fostering magnanimous students influences so many who know him, including John. With deepest, deepest gratitude, Cush, thank you. Through the guidance of Bill Cushman and countless others within the Baylor community, John began to explore his passions. As a Baylor cum laude graduate, he challenged himself with a rigorous academic schedule, worked to become a multi-sport state champion in both wrestling and cross country, embraced the broad spectrum of walkabout, and acted in the spring play. Indeed, John seized the myriad opportunities to learn and grow at Baylor. These experiences helped prepare him to acquire many impressive achievements over the course of his life thus far. But his internal factors, the ones that define our humanity rather than our vanity, or what set John apart in my eyes. Yes, John is on the front line as emergency room physician, but what is forever embedded within my soul is recalling the eve of his graduation from medical school as he humbly treated the medical needs of those living without the dignity of a home. Understanding what it means to be human, John served the homeless on that evening just as he had throughout medical school, and then on into his residency. Yes, John is an elite, world-class ultra-marathoner, competing in some of the world's toughest, most brutal races. One of those is a self-navigated 300-mile race in Italy with about 105,000 feet of climbing and descending through the Alps. To put it in perspective, it'd be kind of like running from here to Memphis and going up and down Mount Everest three times without a road map. Participation is limited to the top global qualifiers, and of those accepted to run this grueling challenge, 
approximately 20% finish. John finished seventh in 2019, and in 2022, he was the only American to complete the race. He'll run a 100-mile marathon, such as the Hard Rock 100 Endurance Run in Colorado, simply as a training, as a training race. Still, for me, one of his most defining races occurred in Ferry, a squatter's village in Kingston, Jamaica. We're down a dusty lane. As a Jamaica tripper, John's legs carried him running and holding laughing children atop his shoulders. Yes, John also teaches as a medical school professor, helped launch Tahoe Wilderness Medicine, and serves as medical director for the Broken Arrow Sky Race. In addition to providing care for myriad ultra running races, he even finds time to write. If you're ever flipping through Ultra Running Magazine, you may indeed come across one of his articles. Woven throughout is his underlying care that profoundly guides him as a husband and father of four. His depth, his sense of integrity, and his fun-loving spirit of adventure are ever-present in their home. So, whether within his home, representing America in global races through the Alps, or competently delivering critical medical care in the emergency room, John's soft-spoken qualities of soul, the components of his character, are not published or recognized in the way that his external achievements have been. They are, however, as Mandela said, foundational to who John is as a person. The kind of human being who lives with humility, generosity of spirit, and leads with sensitivity. He listens more than he speaks, allowing his life to speak for him. I am proud, humbled, and honored to introduce you to my son, John Anderson. That should work. All right, thank you for that uh, generous introduction. Um, I guess if you ever want a, a hype man or hype woman, just ask one of your parents to introduce you, and it's going to turn out all right. Um, you know what? Let me just get this a little tangled up here. You guys hear me all right there in the back? I'll use this. I tend to walk around a little bit, so um, I'm going to try this lapel thing, and if it's not working out, we'll kind of switch back to the regular microphone. But anyway, it is really an incredible honor to be with you guys here today uh, for the Cushman Lecture Series. Um, I honestly, I was talking with someone last night, and I honestly feel like I'm just, I'm kind of a typical Baylor graduate, but I'm really, really honored to be here uh, to tell some stories, spin some yarn, and and uh, spend a little time with you guys today. Uh, you know, this school is, is, is ripe with wisdom. And I'm, I'm really grateful for the time that I had here. Just numerous lessons learned from uh, you know, a number of different Baylor faculty, some of, some of whom are no longer with us. The late great coaches Jim Morgan, Larry Hale, Van Townsend, all people that were very important to me, and many of whom are still here today uh, inspiring you guys and that continue to spy, inspire me. Folks like Chris Watkins and Perry Key, Tim Williams, Heather Ott, Shaq Van Dusen, just to name a few. You know, the list could go on. I could just stand up here and list the people that have influenced me for my whole time. But, of course, there's the old Kushroo, right? Cushman is someone who really helped me focus my lens on the wonder of the world. And all of these people have really helped me uh, and inspired me to adventure. And, and and discover what I'd like to talk with you guys about today. And that's what I call the awe of life. And you know, if you happen to doze off now, that's fine, because that's really the only thing that I hope you remember about today. I want you to be open to finding the awe of life. But how do we find it? How do we define it? Well, let's see if we can dig in a little bit and sort that out. And in particular, I'd like to share with you the story 
of the Tour de Jeans, the, the race that uh, my mother mentioned. And, and again, it's a mountain race over in Europe, around 300 miles. And through this race, this race has meant a lot to me over the years. Um, and it's a place where I've you know, been able to find this awe in life. One year in particular, a uh, few days into the race, it's the middle of the night, uh, I've just climbed up about 5,000 feet from the valley floor up to this, this Italian mountain pass, it's called Col Intralar. And I'm standing on top of this pass, again, middle of the night, it's dark out, clear skies, beautiful stars, a little bit of cold mountain air out there, and I, and I just start crying. And I'm a crier, but that's not unusual. But here I am just standing on the top of this pass, just, just tears streaming down my face. Now, I mean, I wasn't particularly you know, happy or sad or like in a significant amount of pain. You know, I think the tears really came from somewhere different, somewhere else. And I think Edward Abbey described it well when he wrote, I want to weep, not for joy, not for sorrow, but for the un incomprehensible wonder of our brief lives beneath the oceanic sky. And, and like old Cactus Ed, I had found a time and a place where I was open to this incomprehensible wonder. Uh, now this race in particular, let's, let's, let's look at this just a little bit more. You know, this pass itself was, was one of, I don't know, 30, 40 some odd mountain passes that are in the race. Uh, and the Tour de Jeans, or Tour of Giants, or we'll just call it the Tour, um, is, again, it's an ultra-marathon race over in the Alps, mostly in Italy, a little bit in Switzerland, kind of right up along the French border as well. And it's a continuous loop, so it starts and finishes in a town called Cormier, which is uh, on the Italian side of Mont Blanc. And basically, you run this, this, this large loop uh, through the mountains, into the valleys, kind of up and down, uh, into some of the real special places of the Alps. Um, much of it is on mountain trails, so you're kind of run along trails, but there's a fair bit that's off trail uh, where there's, you know, no discernible path, and some of it you get into a little bit more uh, technical type of rock climbing, you know, what we would call fifth class, meaning that you're, you have to use your arms and hands to kind of hold on to things as you're going up some of these, uh, some of these mountainsides. In a few places, there's like fixed ropes and chains, so you can kind of hold on a little bit for safety if you, if you need that as you're going through. And as you kind of traverse the course, you really do see some of the, some of the amazing mountains of the Alps. So there's kind of the aforementioned Mont Blanc. You also head over to see the Matterhorn, uh, Grand Paradiso, Monte Rosa. Uh, you really get to see some spectacular stuff in your time out there. Uh, it is uh, self-navigation, so you're kind of, uh, it's not marked, so you're relying on compass, GPS, maps, things like that to kind of get you around and, and stay in the right place. And in your time there, you, you pass through a number of different ecosystems uh, uh, throughout the course. So you kind of start in some of these really lush valleys, move up into some verdant forests, on into these high mountain meadows, just really fragrant with grasses and wildflowers. And as you keep moving up into the talus and scree, the colors really fade into, into, into shades of gray. And you get to the highest reaches, these highest alpine reaches, where you're right along the glaciers. Uh, you know, these compacted bits of, of ice and snow that have been there for, for two million years helping sculpt the Alps. And there's plenty of time to uh, observe all of these different zones and all of these different areas because uh, sometimes the pace is kind of laughably slow. Uh, there's some like cross country and track runners out there, correct? Yeah, you guys are out there, gals. I'm sure you guys have all seen like four or five minute miles, people running. I don't know if you've ever seen someone take an hour to run one mile, but sometimes that happens in this race. It's almost a comedy of this like imperceptible movement where you're moving pretty slowly at times just due to some of the terrain and, and kind of the cumulative fatigue that you get uh, as you move through the course. Now there are times where you're running pretty well, but there's other times where uh, you really don't know if you're moving forward or backwards and maybe, maybe nobody else knows either. You do carry all of your needed equipment on your back, so you got a little backpack, you've got like all your warm clothes in there, uh, waterproof stuff, you've got headlamps, you've got spares, things like that for the night, kind of basic first aid supplies, uh, food and water. And um, 
stuff that you're going to need to kind of take care of yourself while you're out there, because you, you truly are kind of on your own for, for most of the course. About every 30 or 40 miles or so, you do come down into one of these smaller Italian villages. And, it, you know, when you're there, you can kind of refuel, you get stuff like pizza and espresso and gelato and really kind of tank yourself up every now and again. And then also scattered throughout the course, there's uh, these little mountain huts, these kind of small areas, usually staffed by a mountain guide, where you can also get like a quick nap uh, or a hot meal if you want. Now, as I mentioned, the, the, the clock is continuously running, so it's a continuous race. Uh, and so any time that you do spend napping or eating is just kind of eating into the total time that you have. So again, starts, the clock starts when you leave Cormier, it stops when you get back in there. So the time that you spend sleeping or eating or whatever is up to you, and, and the time that you spend moving is, is actually, you know, obviously to your advantage. Uh, racers overall have around uh, 190 hours or so to complete the course, uh, which is around eight days. Uh, and typically it you know, takes me somewhere in the, the five to six day range to, to complete this course. Uh, over that time, over the five or six days, I'm usually sleeping around seven or eight hours. So it's you know, maybe an hour or so each night, hour or two, a few naps here and there and stuff like that. So, uh, sometimes the sleep deprivation gets, gets pretty wild and some of the hallucinations that you get from these races and your sleep deprivation are pretty intense. And some of these uh, hallucinations, I've had lengthy conversations with dead people. Uh, I've seen like cartoons come to life from, from Snow White. The witch was chasing me one time from Snow White as I was coming down a mountain pass. Um, and you know, and, and, and some of these hallucinations sometimes end up being you know, somewhat meaningful to you. Uh, one time in particular, again, middle of the night, I'm kind of coming through one of these high alpine meadows. We've got these kind of tall grasses moving along, and the, the grasses are kind of waving in the wind. And in my mind, they turned into waves, like ocean waves. The waves kind of grow bigger, and pretty soon I'm seeing some ships on the waves, like these big transoceanic looking schooner things like Magellan might pilot or something like that and the ships are coming towards me. The ships pass me, the waves kind of continue, and then I look down, and my feet disappear. And then pretty soon my legs disappear, and then and I'm looking down at my arms and legs, or excuse me, my arms and hands, and, and they disappear as well. And I had this sense that my entire body had just dissolved into the world around me. Um, it was like this, this sensation of almost wave-like energy and I was really convinced that I had physically kind of ceased to exist as a person, and I, there is no more distinction between myself and this, this kind of universe that was around me. Of course, a couple minutes later, I, I woke up as I was falling face forward into a big rock that was most definitely not a hallucination, but that's kind of stuck with me a little bit. You know, maybe kind of reached this nirvana state while I was out there at some point, but really, a lot of it was just sleep deprivation. Another time, not my personal hallucination, but, um, but another, another runner's hallucination that I came across. So this was probably about 30 miles from the finish. And when you're out there, you know, you will see other runners every now and again, other racers every now and again. And I was kind of coming up this one pass and I see this guy in front of me. It's nighttime, you kind of see his headlamp going off. And I catch up to him and uh, yeah, I could tell he was kind of struggling, he's kind of weaving a little bit. And one of the things about the tour is that, you, you know, not only are you out there for your race, but you also take care of, of other folks if you find someone in distress. And this guy was uh, in a bit of distress, so I, I figured I'd kind of hang out with him for a little bit as we got to a little, little safer place. He looks over at me and he's like, no sleep, only Red Bull, in this kind of thick Bulgarian accent. And, you know, I, what I came to find out was that for the last 24, 48 hours, he's had zero sleep, and he basically just been chugging Red Bull the whole time to keep himself awake. So maybe not different than some of you guys' study habits, I'm assuming. I don't, I don't know. Um, but anyway, so we keep going up the pass, and we're like getting to a more technical stretch here where we're kind of using the fixed ropes and stuff like that. And he stops on this little ledge. We're like 30 feet from the top, and he sits down takes off his shoes, and he starts taking off his, his socks, and I'm like, hey, buddy, what, you know, what are you doing? We, you know, we're in the middle of this, this huge exposed re area. You know, the weather's somewhere between rain and snow. It's cold, and he's taking off his shoes, and he's like, oh, I need to, I need to change my socks. And I was like, you know, I'm looking around. I was like, Where, what are you going to change your socks into? 
first of all. And second of all, why are you choosing to do this right here? But he, there was no reasoning with him at this point. So I just kind of stood there in the rain while he you know, took off his socks and his shoes and then proceeded to put the same socks right back on. Um, we went up and over the pass, got down to this like next mountain hut. And uh, I kind of left him there in the care of the mountain guides. The, as we kind of come in, I was like, hey, you know, you might want to look at this guy. And they're like, we got it, we got it. And so then I kind of proceeded along, went to the finish. I found out a few days later that he'd spent a little bit of time in the mountain hut with the mountain guides, but apparently they uh, were unable to stop him. And he'd been found a couple hours later, completely naked, standing on the top of this bridge. Uh, he just essentially lost his mind. They had to fly in a helicopter and like sedate him and take him to the hospital because he was so far gone in sleep deprivation. But, you know, apart from being able to talk to, talk to ghosts and, and seeing cartoons come to life, you know, the, the tour really has helped me find this, this awe in life, such as up on that mountain pass. And the awe in life, you know, it's an overwhelming sense of presence. It's that immediacy of experience. It's this immersive peace that comes when you're fully present in what you're doing. You know, as you move forward in, in the tour, kind of day and night, the, the tour really becomes, it, it just becomes, right? It, it is what it is. You're, you're just out there. Um, you're just living the moment that you have at hand and really immersed in that. The complexity of life, uh, you know, modern human life, with all the distractions that we have is really stripped bare. It's kind of laid at your feet just to what you're doing at the moment. Climb this mountain, you know, eat this food. It, it's all stripped away. And it's interesting because distance and time, they really lose their traditional sense of measurement and analysis. You're not thinking, how far do I need to go? When's the next stop? Things of that nature. All this analytical processing that your brain is doing all the time really just dissolves away and you're able to be present with the experience that you have. The same with you know, things like, like pain. I mean, at one point, everything in your body hurts, right? I mean, it's, the race is long, everything's gonna hurt at some point, but, but pain is just pain, right? It just, it just is what it is. Sometimes it comes, sometimes it goes. It's not good, it's not bad. It's just there, and then sometimes it's not there. They just kind of floats away. It's, you know, it's really this kind of slow burning reverie that you have when you're out there. It's humbling, sometimes it's dark in nature, but when you're in these experiences, you really have no choice but to accept it because you're just there. There's been a little bit of like scientific research done on this and even at the tour where they do like functional MRIs and EEGs and things like that. We're looking at brain waves and trying to determine, you know, what is this state? You know, you hear people say flow state or something like that, that, that people are in. And, and while there is some data on this, it's, it's still pretty unclear what happens to our brains when we're going through this. And, you know, while long endurance races and some of these mountain adventures have been a path for me, I really do see so many uh, other paths and expressions of this in our everyday lives and opportunities that you guys have in front of you as well. Think of music or art, right? Both in creation and in experience. You all have outstanding resources here to be part of music, drama, performing arts, fine arts, all that sort of stuff. In the words of uh, Thoreau, music is perpetual and only hearing is intermittent, which I think speaks not only to the music, but also our ability to be open to the ongoing and ever-present beauty of the world. Now, speaking of music, uh, as, as my mom mentioned, I've got, I've got four kids, and my, my oldest daughter, one of the things that we, that we like to share is music. So we'll kind of share uh, artists and musicians and kind of pass some music back and forth, and we go see some music together uh, sometimes. Last fall, uh, we went to see, she, she exposed me to a new artist, a guy named Noah Khan, so you guys probably know this guy, and we went to go see him in, in, uh, at Austin City Limits in Texas. And while I was there, kind of watching this guy, you know, I was really overcome by his genuine love and presence in what he was doing, right? And you guys, you know, those of you that are, again, in glee club or band or just, you know, playing the guitar at home, you guys have this in you too. And sometimes it's not just in the uh, creation of music, but it's also in the experiencing it. So Perry Key, who you guys all know, chemistry guru, 
uh, ex-football stud, climber extraordinaire, Perry Key, Perry, you're, oh, okay, perfect. I'm not gonna embarrass you a little bit here, Perry, I hope. So Perry Key's also a musician, right? Perry had a band, Art Society? Is that the band, Perry? I think, anyway. Um, Perry had a band, it was Art Society. And uh, so, you know, Perry is a musician. He's also a connoisseur of music. And I remember one time on a walkabout trip uh, to Waco Tanks, and we're in one of those old 12-passenger vans. There's no seat belts in these things, windows are down, and we're kind of rolling through the East, Tex East Texas desert, and some music comes on. I think, it, I think it was like Led Zeppelin or something similar like that. Perry kind of turns up the music, starts singing. After a little while, he's kind of got his air guitar out, and he's just kind of wailing away on the air guitar, and I look over, guy next to me starts kind of hitting the air drums, and pretty soon the whole band is just kind of rocking out, you know, listening to music, singing, you know, really experiencing that. And, and guys, that's the awe of life too. We're there, we're experiencing that music. You know, and I think you artists out there as well, I, I like to imagine that in the, in the process of art as well. I kind of imagine Michelangelo as he's painting the frescoes in the Sistine Chapel with that same kind of full body experience. You know, for those of you that are in drama, it's on the stage as the lights go down and the curtains come up. Uh, it, it's all out there, right? Perhaps you find it in sport. I know there's a lot of you all that are athletes. And when I was here, you know, I was a wrestler and a runner and sometimes soccer player. And I had coaches who I, I think were so far ahead of their time because really I, I only came to appreciate some of these lessons later in life. Uh, folks like Jim Morgan and Shaq Van Dusen in the wrestling room. And... What they did, and what I've kind of come to realize what they did, is they, they emphasize this process. And what, and what does that mean, your process versus outcomes? You hear that a lot. But, but what that means, I think, is that they invested us in the presence of that practice. When we were there, we were there. We were just engulfed in the moment of the practice itself, and we were very present. You know, sometimes it hurt. You know, you're hungry, you're sweaty, and you're like all kind of scraped up and everything from the mats, but we were there. And... You know, sometimes that process led to, you know, people becoming champions, but honestly, the, the celebration was, was not in getting your arm raised. The celebration was in that whole, those whole moments in the practice room where you were really present. So look for it out there on your soccer fields, your volleyball courts, you know, whatever your sporting venue is, look for it there too, because it's there. And sometimes it's just in the effort and the capacity of the human body. It's that, as I mentioned, I was you know, a runner here, and it's that copper taste in your mouth and like the, just the crush of gravity on your legs as you're in the last couple hundred meters of a three-mile race, right? That's the awe of life. Trophies and medals and all those sorts of things, those are going to fade and those are going to gather dust. But if you can immerse yourself in, in the reverie of your sport, those are the memories that are going to remain vivid to you. I think you can also find this awe in your service to others, in your relationships. And, you know, the work done in service to something bigger than yourself is undoubtedly going to bring a fullness to your heart. Uh, as my mother mentioned, you know, she ran, she, you guys all know she ran the service program here for 20-some-odd years. And when you hear her talk about it, you know, the, the, the glow in her eyes, I don't think, is from, you know, the meals served or the education funded uh, or the presents given at the Christmas party. It's, it's from that connection of the human spirit that, that, that we all experience when we're truly present with someone. That's the on life, right? And sometimes it's in the relationships that are just with the people right around you. You know, it's your friends, it's your loved ones, it's the people that are sitting next to you. You know, if you love someone, love them. You know, allow yourself to be amazed by that love. There's a reason that, you know, poets write so much about love. It's because there's so much of this wonder in life and love. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the senior trip during the Cushman Lecture Series. So those of you seniors are getting ready to go embark on the senior trip, and the senior trip is most assuredly a place to, to find the splendor in life. You know, the principles of the senior trip, adventure, connection, reflection in the woods, you know, these also inspire the poets. And as you seniors will, will find yourself here in a, in a month or so, you're gonna be sitting down on, on the hill or, or hunkered down, as some people might say, on this hill overlooking the pond, 
overlook in the lake there, and, and some of your faculty members are going to read passages to you. And some of those are going to stick with you. One that stuck with me is uh, from the philosopher scientist Lauren Isley. Uh, and he, I think he expresses this wonder that, that people will find in the wild as well. In The Immense Journey, he writes, it is a commonplace of all religious thought, even the most primitive, that the man seeking visions and insight must go apart from his fellows and live for a time in the wilderness. If he is of the proper sort, he will return with a message. It may not be a message from the God he set out to seek, but even if he has failed in that particular, he will have had a vision or seen a marvel. And these are always worth listening to and thinking about. Now, I, I felt many of these marvels in the mountains and the rivers and the woods all over the world, from, from the Alps to the Gobi Desert to the Rockies. And, you know, sometimes the marvels in that adventure and sometimes the marvels in the quiet as you're floating along in a canoe on the Chattooga River or in a raft deep within the walls of the Grand Canyon. Perhaps you're just sitting on a rock overlooking the Tennessee Valley in quiet meditation as the oak leaves rustle around you. Look for it there because you may be astonished by these woods as well. And finally, there's one more place that is full of opportunities to find this all in life where you guys all spend a portion of your day, a good portion of your day, and that's in the classroom, right? It's in the learning, it's in the discovery, it's also in the teaching. You know, seeing chemistry literally erupting out of the beakers, reading the words of Plato, speaking your first conversation in a foreign language, understanding uh, why calculus is the calculus, uh, feeling the, the same torn sense of place that John Grady Cole feels in All the Pretty Horses, finding a voice for your own poetry. Days on the hill are full of these chances. Now, walking through these halls, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of memories, and one memory in the classroom in particular, it was actually in the chapel here, corner classroom, just a, just a few floors down. This was Cushman's class. It was my senior year, and I, the class was something like uh, wilderness literature or wilderness and philosophy or something like that. And in this particular day, uh, Cushman is literally, he's just reading a list of birds that the author is encountering on his, uh, you know, on his daily life. And Cushman's reading this list, and as he reads this list, he gets more and more excited, right? His eyes are getting bigger, his voice is growing louder, his arms start kind of wildly gesticulating, and pretty soon, all of us students are kind of up out of our chairs as well, and Cush's voice is just booming out over the Tennessee River. He's a loon, uh, spotted sandpiper, warbler, yellow-bellied sapsucker. That was, that was a pretty amazing experience, and that is something that was most definitely the awe of life. Now, finding your amazement in life, guys, it's, it's not always easy. Right? Sometimes there's a struggle with it. And if we could go back to the tour just for a little bit, back to the tour de Jean's, there's this, kind of this legend at the tour, the legend of the dragon. And the way that it works is when you start in Cormier, a dragon starts in Cormier as well, and it goes the opposite direction. And since the, the tour itself is a big loop, eventually you're going to encounter the dragon somewhere on the course, and you're going to have a struggle with that dragon. Right? So finding your wonder isn't always easy. Sometimes there's a dragon, and sometimes there's a struggle. And sometimes, honestly, that difficulty makes your passage even more meaningful. And sometimes that struggle is the meaning. So in closing, I hope you all can see that there's many paths on this journey. Sometimes the paths are exciting and boisterous, and sometimes they're quiet and they're serene. The adventure isn't about what you do, but it's about how you experience life. So go and sing loud, run fast, run slow, sit on a mountaintop, swim in a river, celebrate your learning, show your love, be a Cushman. Be open to the awe in life. Thank you.